Again, welcome everybody to Paleo Talks. We are coming to you from Johnson City, Tennessee and the Center of Excellence in Paleontology, which oversees the Gray Fossil Site. Uh, just continuing this series on uh, pretty much every week. I think we're gonna take a week off next week because of the Thanksgiving holiday, but we will continue this series on until you kick us off. I think that's the plan right now. Uh, we also have Dr. Chris Widgo with us who will hopefully jump in with questions as well. <clears throat> and let's just move right on over to Carrie and Dr. Prasik. And Carrie, if you could go ahead and share your screen. And then what I'd like to jump into before we really get far into Hagerman is a little bit more about your background, how you became a paleontologist. And you know, what led you down this particular path of paleontology, what schools you went to, and then eventually how you ended up at Hagerman as well. Again, welcome. Thank you. Um, sure. So, uh, you know, I wanted to be a paleontologist when I was little, like most kids, um, was told that no, I, you don't actually get to grow up to be one. Um, kind of shifted to art, went to college for art got stubborn and decided that I was going to be a paleontologist after all and changed my majors. Um, and so that was, I went to the University of Pittsburgh um, and majored in uh, anthropology and paleobiology. And then I went to the Center for Human Evolutionary Studies at Rutgers University for my PhD, where I worked on fossil birds from the early hominid site of Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. Uh, so I was looking at how birds could help us reconstruct the landscapes that our really ancient human ancestors um, were living on. Um, I wasn't actually necessarily interested in birds when I started the program. I actually was going to work on hominid carnivore interactions, um, especially in terms of carcass acquisition. Um, but as often is the case, you know, your graduate advisor has other plans for you. Um, so I was kind of dragged kicking and screaming into working on the birds. Uh, which actually turned out to be great. Um, they turned out to be a really great environmental indicator. Uh, the birds for Olduvai were fascinating, and so it turned out to be an awesome project. Uh, when I uh, defended, I was applying for positions, and I saw this one at Hagerman, um, and I wasn't even really aware at the time that um, there were specific paleontologists in the Park Service, um, so that was kind of a surprise for me. Um, I applied for it, I was hired, um, that was eight years ago, um, and so I'm kind of still here uh, today. Um, I've switched my research focus a little bit. I still work on birds from Olduvai, um, so I've had some work just recently that came out on some more um, Olduvai collections, um, but I also work on uh, carnivorans now, so I finally got to kind of work on what I wanted to work on um, in the first place. Um, and so I have a variety of projects um, that I've um, worked on and I'm working on um, that involve carnivorans both at Hagerman and then elsewhere. All right. Thank you. Now, are there birds there at Hagerman that you're working there on as well? Are, there are. Um, and it was funny because when I got the job, everyone said, oh, there's lots of birds there um, <laughs> for you to work on. Um, and I will admit that I have not done a lot with them. I have gone through the collections um, and updated some identifications. Um, and I've done a little bit with looking at how the communities kind of shift through time, um, but I haven't really uh, given the birds the amount of focus that they probably deserve because they're actually a, a really nice accumulation here at Hagerman as well. Wow, yeah, because a lot of fossil sites just don't have a good bird record and we definitely don't have that many bird paleontologists out there. All right, so if you wanna go ahead and get over into the slide mode here and just sort of start working your way through the presentation. Okay. Oh, that's the wrong one. I've got to click on that thing again. There we go. We got Perfect. it? Perfect. Okay. Sweet. Okay, um, so I am going to be talking about research by the Hagerman Paleontology Environments and Tephrochronology Project. I know that's a mouthful, so I'm just going to call it the pet project. Um, and the research that we're doing here at the Hagerman Fossil Beds. So the Hagerman Fossil Beds are uh, part of the Glens Ferry Formation uh, that kind of runs along the bottom of southern Idaho up to the Oregon border. 
The monument itself uh, became uh, established in 1988 in large part due to the importance of the uh, Hagerman Horse Quarry, uh, which is found in the northern end of the monument. It's a national historic landmark um, and it was really extensively excavated by the Smithsonian back in 1928 to 1934, which is really what kind of put uh, Hagerman on the map. Our age estimates are from about 4.2 to 3.07 million years in age. I say about because um, the 3.07 is a pretty solid date for just above the horse quarry, but the 4.2 is a date um, based on paleomag data uh, from back in like the 1970s. And so we're trying um, to get a more refined uh, basal date for the fossil beds. And some of the data that we're getting back suggests that it might actually be closer to 4.5 or 4.6. This is what the fossil beds look like. Um, they're a series of really steep bluffs um, that are not always a joy uh, to walk along. Um, thankfully, we do have the Snake River abutting the monument and we actually take advantage of that uh, to get to a lot of the fossil localities that are closer to the river. Uh, the Smithsonian actually had the same idea back in the 1920s. They used rafts to uh, carry their, um, their gear and supplies across the river to the horse quarry. And you can actually see here that they have horses on this raft. Um, and the reason for this, and I think it's really kind of cool, is that they were using live horses to help pull out the jackets of fossil horses out of the horse quarry. Um, so you know, they were um, also utilizing the river to access um, some of the sites. You can see uh, that the monument's really heavily vegetated and usually with a fossil locality, you want exposure. Exposure is your friend. It helps you to find fossils that are eroding out. Unfortunately, back in 2008, we had a major fire that burned about 80 some percent of the monument. And after that, the invasive grasses really came in. So this has been kind of an ongoing battle where we're trying to fight these grasses that are really kind of obscuring sites and are making it a lot more difficult to monitor for fossils because less things are naturally eroding out because of the amount of um, ground cover. And if we look at this picture right here, are there any localities on this that you can point out? I, I could, but I won't. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we hold our localities very close to our chest here in the Park Service. Um, but I can tell you that uh, while we are famous for the horse quarry, we literally have fossils eroding out from one end of the monument to the other. Uh, that's one of the things that makes it really hard to kind of connect all the fossils in time and space because of how scattered everything is. So, um, so the short answer is yes, there's fossils. <laughs> Thank you. There's fossils are there. Yeah. <laughs> so um, our localities, uh, we do have the horse quarry um, and we do have some other things that occasionally um, do need to be excavated out um, and jacketed and removed. Um, but a lot of our fossils because of the steepness of the slopes are just eroding out individually. Um, so they're isolated surface finds. Uh, we also get a lot of fossils in uh, sandy blowouts uh, like we have in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and so we'll go and do screening there to look for specimens. And then ants, surprisingly enough, um, kind of help us to find a lot of microfauna. Uh, ants like to build nests out of small pebbles. Turns out they find uh, things like rodent teeth and bones and um, small um, fish bones to be great um, replacements for stone. Um, and you can actually see in this picture, the ant is literally carrying a rodent femur um, on his way to the nest. Um, so that's where we get a lot of our microfaunal accumulations are from ant hills. This is a, a mural by Jay Maternus that really kind of gives you a picture of what Hagerman looked like four million years ago. Uh, we did have an ancestral version of the Snake River. Um, and then we also had a now extinct lake called Paleo Lake Idaho uh, that would have um, fluctuated greatly during the about million years time of um, of Hagerman, um, and we kind of refer to Hagerman as being a lacustrian plain environment, which means a lakeshore environment. And it would have varied from being lower, middle, or upper lacustrian plain uh, based on what the size and position of the lake was at any given time. Uh, one of the things that's great about this image is it really shows you uh, the richness of the fauna that we have at Hagerman, that we are more than just the Hagerman horse quarry. Uh, one of the things I love about the Pliocene is that we have this great mix of um, extinct and very modern animals. So we have things like giant ground sloths and mastodon living alongside of beavers and pronghorn antelope and cormorants. 
Uh, you'll also notice that there's some critters shown here that we don't find in North America today, but we actually find down in South America. Things like llamas, peccaries, and grayson. Um, and this really attests to the change in climate from the Pliocene to today, and the fact that during the Pleistocene, a lot of animals kind of headed down south um, due to glaciation and, and um, decreases in temperatures. And so these are animals that used to be in Idaho, um, but are now associated with and really uh, flourish in uh, South America today. Uh, the one problem with a mural like this is that this is kind of a composite of a million years of, of history at Hagerman. Um, so some of these animals may have actually not lived at the same time as others and may have actually been separated by even hundreds of thousands of years. And so that is really the inspiration for the pet project in that we wanted to take this million year chunk of time and parse it into a number of paleo landscapes. Um, so, so distinct parts of time where we could then look at the animal communities for a particular landscape and then compare them um, to see how these communities change across time and space. So what I'm going to do is kind of introduce some of the animals that we have here at Hagerman. Obviously not all 200 species that have been identified for here because that would take forever, um, but really kind of focus on some of the animals that are a focus of our project in particular. And if you see a star next to an animal, that's something I'm going to be coming back to when I talk about our volcanic ashes. So can't talk about Hagerman without our horses. Um, Equus simplicitans, single-toed horse. Uh, our horse quarry is a large sandstone uh, unit that's actually three separate units. Um, one doesn't really have any fossils coming out of it. One was an attritional or slow accumulation of bones, something very similar to what you would see at a watering hole in Africa today. And then the third unit is a mass death of horses. Um, we have about 200 horses that have come out of the horse quarry. Um, and we think that it was probably something like they got caught up in a flood and then were very quickly um, buried um, before um, scavengers or weathering could really impact um, the bones. Uh, we know the age, we have a really good handle on the age for the horse quarry because an ash very conveniently laid itself right on top. Um, and we have that dated at 3.07. But one thing we're really interested in is trying to figure out what localities at Hagerman were contemporaneous to the horse quarry. And the reason for that is that we think that there was a prolonged drought in this upper part of the monument um, and that that was what led um, to perhaps the, the demise of these horses. So we wanted to be able to find contemporaneous localities where we might be able to find some environmental indicators that could point to how the environment had changed. This is our peccary, Platygonus piercei. Uh, this is a holotype. Um, so it was first discovered and described from here at Hagerman. Um, and this is the specimen shown below. It's an adult and two partial juveniles. Uh, this is one of my favorite fossils from Hag Hagerman. I think it's just gorgeous. Um, and it's at the Smithsonian. It's from the Smithsonian excavations in the late 20s, early 30s. And unfortunately, we don't know where this type locality is. Uh, back then, you didn't have GPS units, um, you usually didn't have nice topographic maps to map where things were. And so our descri description um, that we have for where this locality is, is that it was three to four miles south of the horse quarry. That doesn't help us a whole lot. Um, we know based on this picture, which we believe is taken from this locality, um, that it was higher up in the sequence. That makes sense because peccaries are more common higher up in the sequence, but we're, we really don't know where this locality is today. Fortunately, we do have another peccary locality that's in the far southern end of the monument. Uh, this was excavated by the University of Michigan Museum of Paleontology. Um, and so we're really interested in seeing, um, finding out the age of that deposit, in part because it's at the same elevation as the horse quarry. And so we have long kind of associated the peccary and the horse quarry sites as being contemporaneous. Um, and I just want to give a quick shout out to Reed Saltis. Uh, he is a paleo artist who has been doing some work for us here at Hagerman. Um, and so this is one of his drawings of the peccaries. Um, and we're just really happy with the work he's doing. And I love the opportunity to kind of share his work because I think he's doing a really great job um, reconstructing some of our animals. Carrie, that specimen that was showed semi-articulated, yeah. is, is that the way that the specimens are typically preserved? No, uh, that's a great question. And in fact, that is um, kind of um, outside of the horse quarry, we kind of find um, isolated bones and we're lucky if it's even a complete bone. 
Uh, we very rarely find things um, that are still articulated and even rarer to find anything that's complete like this. Uh, so this is definitely not the norm for uh, what we get at Hagerbin. Thanks. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we do have a number of um, ungulates and some other uh, larger fauna. I'm sure Greg's going to tell me this is not the right sloth picture. I apologize in advance. Um, but we do have a number of other larger fauna here at Hagerman. None of them are particularly um, important for having been here. They're very typical for this time period. Um, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these. Um, but I am going to spend more time on our carnivorans because they're my favorite. Uh, so the uh, musteloids are very rich. Uh, we do have one skunk. And thanks to Wally at ETSU, we've confirmed that we do have a raccoon. So we have procyonids here as well. And then the mustelids are not really necessarily common throughout the deposits, um, but they're very rich. Um, and some things are more common than others. Um, so uh, trigonictus, uh, macrodon, and kukai um, are both these small um, weasel-like animals that we think gave rise to either grisons or teras, uh, which are both animals that are found in South America today. Uh, this is a picture of a, a living tera for comparison. And then our otter, um, our larger otter, Cetherium piscinarium, is also pretty common throughout the monument. Uh, this is a, a giant otter. It's thought to have given rise to the giant Brazilian otter. Um, and then we also have a second otter now, which is uh, Launcher weirai. This one's really important because it's thought to be the earliest example of the uh, New World River genus of Lantra uh, for North and South America. Um, and we really wanted to get a better handle on the date for it because geneticists had long said that Lantra had appeared sometime around 3.8 to 4 million years ago. Paleontologists had nothing below 1.8. Um, and so this, um, which was projected as being at least 3.8 million years in age, um, really fell in line with what the geneticists were saying. So we wanted to get um, a better date for this as well. Baronestrix is probably my favorite animal uh, for the entire Pliocene. This is an incredibly rare animal. It's only known, this species is only known from Hagerman. Nowhere else in the world is Baronestrix vorax found. Uh, this genus is only known from one other locality in the entire world, and that's Siberia. It's a different species that's a lot larger and is found in much younger deposits. And I have a great story about this. Um, so the stuff in Siberia, they only have cranial material, so they don't have any postcranial material. And then at Hagerman, all we had was part of a jaw and a femur that Philip Bjork found in the 1960s. And that was it. Um, haven't found anything, decades of monitoring at Hagerman, and then 2020 rolls around. Um, and for whatever reason, decided to be a good year for Hagerman in that we found more of Farinestrix. Um, and the story behind this is our tephrochronologist, uh, Laura Walkup. Uh, was um, in the process of um, getting coordinates for a volcanic ash that she was sampling. She was waiting for the satellites to um, come in, um, and she saw what she later referred to as another stupid mid-shaft fragment. Uh, we find lots of mid-shaft fragments. They're not very important. We tend to pick them up, make sure there's nothing diagnostic, uh, not anything taphonomically interesting on it, and then if they're just a surface find, we don't collect them. Um, but she saw that it was sticking out of the ground, so it was kind of in situ. Uh, she recognized that there was a recent break on it and was like, okay, well, I'm just sitting here. I'm going to pull this out and see what it is. And so then she texted me, I found something with pointy teeth, um, <laughs> which told us it was a carnivorin, which was exciting. Um, and then she sent me the picture and it was literally one of those jaw dropping moments uh, where I knew right away it was for an estrix, and then I immediately dismissed that. No, it could not be for an estrix. Um, pulled out a cast that we had of it, compared it. It was for an estrix, still denied it, compared it to a bunch of other things, and was like, no, 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 this is for an estrix. Um, so by the time I got out to where she was at, um, she had found um, some more of the lower jawbone. And so we now have um, more teeth and uh, more of the jaw than the holotype specimen had. Um, and what's really interesting is as rare as this animal is, uh, the stuff that Bjork found were way up on the top of bluffs, and Laura could not have been further down in a gully than she was when she found these. So we really wanted to see how much time span difference there was between Bjork's finds and the stuff that Laura had found. Our dogs, uh, we have a uh, Borophagus, our bone crushing dog. We also have two species of Canis, Ferox and Lepophagus. I'll be talking about Lepophagus a bit later. 
Uh, we have two bears. We have some scrappy bits of a black bear. And then we have some equally scrappy bits of Agriotherium. Uh, but these scrappy bits are kind of exciting because Agriotherium in North America was thought to have um, gone extinct by the hemp, end of the Hemphilian. And so we weren't really expecting to find it here. Um, and so the author Samuels et al um, were able to confirm um, that it was found right below um, bed G, which is dated at 3.79. Um, so it was firmly in um, the Hagerman fossil beds. And so we wanted to just get a better idea of what the uh, maximum age range was uh, for this site. For whatever reason, I have no pictures of our fossil cats um, and they're currently in uh, storage because we're in the process of moving to a new facility. Um, but we do have Homotherium, Megantiron, Felis lacustris, and Lynx rex rodensis. However, none of them are very common. The cats in large part are pretty rare on the monument. Um, so this is just a nice collage of feral cats that I've met um, in my travels. Um, you can't have a Zoom meeting without at least one cat showing up. So um, here's your, here's your um, house cats for the, for the talk. Um, and then one thing that we do actually have a lot of are our rodents. Um, and we also have quite a few lagomorphs, so I've thrown those onto the slide as well. Uh, things like voles uh, make up about 40% of our collection. Uh, so things like Ophiomys here. Uh, our beaver, it's just not a field day if you don't find some beaver. It's just ubiquitous all over the monument. Um, and then we also have things like our giant marmot, Pythana marmota. Uh, we have a muskrat, uh, ground squirrels, and other uh, smaller rodents, as well as several um, species of rabbit. So, Carrie, how giant is a giant marmot? Um, not as giant as you would hope it would be. Um, <laughs> it's definitely a lot larger than uh, modern marmot marmots. Um, and in fact, at our visitor center, uh, we have um, a skull of it on display compared to a modern uh, marmot skull. Um, and it's about, the skull is about twice as big in size, um, but a little disappointing um, for not, not being the, quite as big. Not the yeah, giant we beaver also don't have, of... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And yeah. we also don't have the giant beavers of the Pleistocene either. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a question I get a lot about the beavers, you know, because people hear about those giant beavers and I'm like, no, ours are pretty much very regular beavers. Uh, pretty much. So um, good environmental indicators, uh, but not super exciting um, otherwise. <laughs> Don't tell Josh I said that. I know he, he likes birds <laughs> a lot. Um, and so in terms of birds, uh, we are one of the best North American sites for birds, uh, not unfortunately for the quality. Uh, we don't have beautiful complete skeletons, uh, which tends to be isolated bones, uh, but we do have a really um, diverse range of birds. They uh, are dominated by water and wetland birds, which isn't surprising considering the lake and river, um, but we do have some other things as well, um, including um, owls, um, a new world vulture, and, um, and a variety of um, shorebirds. And then finally, we have um, a selection of creepy crawlies. We've got frogs, fish, turtles, snake. Um, and then we also know that we have crawfish, not from the preservation of crawfish, but from the preservation of gastroliths, which are basically little tummy stones um, that they don't use like you'd see with like birds or crocodiles. These are actually concretions um, that they then absorb um, when they're shedding their um, outer shell and creating a new one. Um, so we have a variety of these um, um, lower vertebrates um, and then invertebrates as well. Also not shown here is um, a number of um, uh, gastropods, um, so snails, and then also um, a variety of clams are also found here on the monument. So uh, you can tell the Hagerman fauna is obviously very rich, um, which is great. Um, but like I mentioned, it's a million years of time. Um, and so you know, it's a very time average assemblage to kind of lump them all together. And so I really wanted to be able to parse out those landscapes and, and look at these very separate communities. And so this is where um, the work of a tephrochronologist comes in. Uh, so Laura Walkup is with the USGS, um, US Geological Survey. And what she does is she studies volcanic ashes. And volcanic ashes are how we date our fossils when you go back in time as far as the Pliocene. Uh, so we have to date them relative to volcanic ashes. Uh, so these are just a few pictures of uh, Laura in the field uh, doing her thing. And so this here is a composite uh, column, a stratigraphic composite column of the ashes and basalt flows that we knew were on the monument before. Um, this was from work by Hart and Bresky in 1999. Uh, they kind of started essentially the tephrochronology project here and then were unfortunately not able to continue it. 
uh, and they were able to get um, dates for the Hagerman horse quarry. Um, they've actually um, refined this now to 3.07. Um, and then they got dates for the deer gulch and shoestring basalt. Unfortunately, all three of these are in the northern extent of the monument, so they can't really be projected out across the monument in any way. And then they also got a date for the for bed G at 3.79, um, which is the date that we tend to use here on the monument for dating things. But you can see though, if you look at the lower half of that comment, column, um, there's a number of ashes, but none of them have dates. And that's more than half of the monument. And so we really wanted to, to try and get dates for those ashes and also um, map them um, across the monument. So just to give you an idea of the way um, that we've dated things here and how we often date things um, at fossil localities is, let's say we have a volcanic ash and it's at 860 meters above sea level and we've dated it to 4.2 million years. We would then project that date across the landscape. So if you had a fossil locality that was below 860 meters, it was older than 4.2. If you had a site that was above 860 meters, it was younger than 4.2 million years. And that's how we would date um, our fossils. Um, we would, that's also how we um, connected localities as well. So if you had two fossil localities and they're at the same elevation, like our peccary and horse site, uh, we would assume that they were contemporaneous. Uh, this requires three major assumptions though. One is that the landscape was flat and featureless and stayed that way for a million years. Uh, second, that the uh, erosion and deposition on the monument would have been the same or canceled each other out. And then third, that there was no faults on the monument, either um, post-depositional or occurring during sedimentation or sed sedimentary. Uh, so, you know, we really wanted to be able to map these ashes out across the monument to see if they really did stay at the same vertical elevation or not. And we kind of had a hunch um, that they wouldn't. So, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what the monument, so this is a uh, Peter's Gulch ash, um, and this is in your perfect world where you have this nice ash that's cooperating and is found at the next bluff over, and then in theory you could just continue uh, tracing it along the monument. However, this ash peters out and then is not found again anywhere else exposed on the monument. Um, you have to dig for it. Um, so first of all, the ashes are not very well exposed, and um, second, we're not really sure where they even are. Um, the second issue then with the uh, faults, uh, Bjork as well as Maldane Powers back in the 60s identified a really major fault on the southern end of the monument um, and we were able to confirm that um, as well as find a number of other smaller faults on the monument. These don't look very big um, but 5-10 meters of difference can really impact it and add up when you're trying to figure out the maximum or minimum age of a particular fossil species. So this is what uh, Laura was kind of tasked at doing. Uh, this is her fourth year of doing it, coming out here every summer um, and collecting ash samples. And so each of these circles on the map is an ash that Laura has sampled and then using major and minor um, element analysis, been able to uh, match with other samples um, as being a particular um, volcanic eruption event um, to be able to then map those ashes across the monument. And you can see the diagram down on the bottom, there's all these nice little color clusters. And what those are are individual samples that cluster together based on their chemistry. Uh, so that tells you that those are um, samples that actually came from the same ash. So looking back at that uh, strap column, you can see um, we now actually have a lot more ashes than we did before. And the reason for that was because Laura had to do a lot of digging. Uh, she spent a lot of time digging on the monument, looking for these things that were buried under vegetation, buried under overburden and soil. And in looking for the ashes that we knew we had, she managed to find six new ones. Um, and so at one point I was like, stop finding ashes. <laughs> um, it's great for me because the more ashes we have, the more slices of time we can divide this um, million years into, um, but it also makes a lot more work for her. Uh, so you can see now we've got almost twice as many um, ashes on the monument than we thought we had. Um, but again, this is a um, composite column. Uh, this isn't what we're looking for. We really wanna see how these ashes um, varied um, vertically across the landscape. 
And so what we need for that is a fence diagram. And so what this is, is basically taking sections of the monument from south to north um, and mapping up those volcanic ashes um, for um, various sections of the monument. And you can see right away that all of our assumptions were um, confirmed, were, 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 all of our concerns about the assumptions were confirmed. Um, and that, first of all, there was a huge fault on the southern end of the monument. So if you look at that very first column, and then you look at the next one and you look at how the ashes are mapped, um, you can see evidence that there was a major fault right there. And then if you pick any one of those ashes and just follow it across the landscape to the north, you can see how it really varies across the landscape. And so that confirms that you can't find an isolated ash somewhere and then project it confidently based on whatever elevation it's at. Uh, so now I'm going to kind of turn it back to the paleo side of things. Um, the critters that I mentioned earlier that were starred, um, the horse starting, first of all, um, you know, we wanted to find contemporaneous sites for it. We thought the peccary site was contemporaneous, but you can tell by looking um, at that pink ash, that's bed J, right below the peccary. And if you look at the horse quarry and look to see where uh, bed J is there, it's much further down below in the sequence. So the peccary is actually older than the horse quarry. Um, and in fact, we were not able to find any contemporaneous sites um, for the horse quarry, which is unfortunate. Our bear, uh, we agree Ethereum, we wanted to make sure um, that it, you know, what age it was. Um, it is definitely below bed G, which is 3.8. Um, but it's also above this red bed right here, which is bed F, um, which is kind of an important bed I'll, you'll see in a minute. Um, so we're able, if we can get a date for bed F, um, we'll have a maximum date um, for that bear um, here at Hagerman as well. I'm going to jump over to the otter. Um, I kind of went out on a limb when I published the paper saying that it was definitely um, older than 3.8 because I was projecting bed G um, like we had been doing here. And I was like, oh man, I hope I wasn't wrong. Um, and so literally, literally when Laura got here, my first thing I said, go find me bed G at the otter site. Please find me bed G. Um, and she went and she found it. And thankfully it was well above the otter. Um, in fact, it was higher above the otter than we thought. So the otter is even older than we thought. And it again occurs just above um, bed F. Uh, Farinestrix, if you recall, I said that she found things way down in the bottom of a gully. Um, so you can see where she found hers way down at the bottom. The things that Bjork found were way up on the top of a bluff. And you can see when they map out, they are separated by several hundred thousand of years, which is cool because Farinestrix is super rare. It's only known from here at Hagerman, yet we now have evidence that it persisted on the landscape here for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, so we're really hoping we can find some more um, of this animal. And then finally, we have um, our dog, Canis lepophagus. And so uh, just to kind of give you an idea, oh, my slide's not advancing. Mm. Oh no, oh shoot. Okay, my slide's not advancing, which is good because it's at the end, I guess. All right, maybe um, we can try and unshare. Okay. See if that helps. Stop share. Um, okay. See if, it'll, see if it'll advance without you having sharing it. Yeah, so it let me advance when I wasn't sharing. And so right. let me just go in here and then share again. So close, we were almost done. <laughs> And then on the current slide, and then flip these. I'm getting really good at this. Okay, so here's my final slide, second to last slide. Uh, so Canis lepophagus, um, some of you are probably grumbling out there in Facebook land saying Canis lepophagus isn't at Hagerman anymore. Um, and the reason for that is that we had Canis lepophagus. It was identified um, in 1970 by Bjork. In 2009, Tedford et al. reassigned the specimens from Hagerman to Canis ferox. That totally stands. Hagerman's um, of Canis are Canis ferox, except for one specimen um, that was really deep jawed and robust. Um, it was definitely Canis lepophagus. Um, but unfortunately, where it was found was right at the base of a fluvial wash. And of course, this was something we really wanted to know where it came from on the monument. And it was like, well, it could have come from down where this star to the left is, um, or it could have come from somewhere up on top. Um, and we had no idea and we wanted to know because one, we would have expected it to be higher up in the sequence based on the age of other um, specimens of this dog. 
Um, and two, with it being really robust, we really expected it to be kind of a later specimen. So Laura went off looking for ashes um, and in doing so found one of her new ashes, the rattlesnake ash. A uh, fun story about that, it's named the rattlesnake ash because she literally disturbed a nest of rattlesnakes while she was trying to sample uh, the ash. Um, we have a lot of great stories from the monument or I don't know how either of us haven't like been severely injured by now. Um, but yeah, she had about six rattlesnakes um, while she was trying to sample. Um, and then she was able to find uh, beds G and F um, above where the dog was found. And then we found bed, um, our, our, the fossil gulch ash, and then we found bed F below it. Um, we have projected the Peters Gulch ash below that because it would have been about um, 25, 30 feet under the ground. Um, and neither of us felt like spending the summer digging a big hole and we had no interns to help us dig a big hole. Uh, so instead we just projected it from uh, the bluff immediately to the east, but we're very confident about that. So while Laura was digging up ashes and you know disturbing rattlesnakes, I was doing a number of um, small excavations, trying in vain to find some more of the dog, um, either down below or somewhere up above to confirm where it came from. Um, and that's the kind of thing that never works out the way that you want it to, except this time it actually did. Um, and we did find a cuboid um, about 38 meters immediately to the east of where the dog jaw was found. Um, so that pretty well confirmed that the dog did come from this lower deposit. Um, and so if we can get a date for bed F, uh, we'll have a maximum age range for a number of um, our critters that we're really kind of um, interested in finding out more about. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing here uh, with the pet project. Uh, Laura is uh, waiting for, she's got some data starting to come in now. The pandemic has slowed some things down, uh, but she's getting uh, TIMS and IPCMS data. Um, TIMS is thermal ionization mass spectrometry, which probably doesn't clarify anything at all. Um, but what that is, is is looking at the ashes and trying to figure out what volcanoes they came from. So we're pretty sure our silicic ashes came from the Cascades of Oregon and Washington, and that the basalt probably came from more localized volcanoes in Idaho. Um, but as a volcanologist, she wants to know which volcanoes um, sections these came from. Um, so we're waiting for some of that information starting to come in. Um, and then the IPCMS data is basically looking at um, some of the rare isotopes in these ashes um, to help us with some of the ashes that are kind of hard to parse out um, just to get a better understanding of um, which ashes uh, we're looking at. So um, so that's it. That's uh, what we're doing. Um, so this is my acknowledgement slide. Uh, lots of people to thank, especially you guys uh, for inviting me. Um, you know, I was really excited to kind of come and and talk about Hagerman and let people know about some of the work that's going on here. Um, and just a quick uh, mention, we are looking for a pollen person and someone who does lithostratigraphy. So if any of those types of folk are listening, um, definitely drop me a line because uh, that's kind of the next stage of this project is really starting to uh, reconstruct the environments in between all of those ashes. All right. Thank you, Carrie. That was yeah. really, really interesting. I have a couple questions before we get to the audience. Uh, one is about, you know, when should we expect to hear more about the dates? When do you think that Soon. would be? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we hope. Um, yeah, so funny story with the dates. Um, we had some samples that we had sent out. Um, the government shut down, um, so that was delayed um, because it was USGS that was dating them. Um, and then we found out that we didn't have uh, the feldspars that we needed uh, to really get some solid dates. So we went and we got some new samples and we processed those, which is a kind of a time consuming process to get them ready. Um, and then the pandemic hit. Um, so now we're kind of waiting for the pandemic to calm down um, with the hopes that when we send these samples in, we'll be able to get some dates, particularly for bed F and the Peters Gulch ash. Uh, those are two, are two um, ashes that we're really, really interested in getting dates for. And then we're also hoping to get a more refined date for bed F because that date um, was based on glass, um, not on feldspar. Um, it's a pretty confident date, but we know we can get it um, a little bit more refined than what we have. And so yeah, the, soon, hopefully. <laughs> the model uh, that you showed, the figure that you showed, we we're actually looking at connecting the ashes moving across space. Has that been published? 
It has not. Uh, we are working on um, publishing that right now. We have, um, so we have that, and then we have our dog paper. Um, a couple of things that we're kind of working in the manuscript phase um, to get those published. Um, and that's just part of the actual fence diagram. Um, Laura's fence diagram is obnoxiously huge. Um, and so it's, it was not, um, could not fit on the screen, basically. So I said, Laura, you need to parse this down. Um, <laughs> well, it's such cool just, work. Yeah, just give me the things that are, you know, that really focus on the critters that we're interested in. Um, and then the publication is going to have this very extensive, ridiculous um, fence diagram. <laughs> um, so, so that's only part of the data. Right okay. there well, one more before we get to the audience, and that is uh, public opportunities or opportunities for students that you might have for working at Hagerman. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so we have routine, routinely used the uh, Geoscientists in the Park program, um, which has just changed over. We're now calling it the Scientists in the Park program through the National Park Service. And so um, college interns, um, either current college students, recent graduates, or graduate students um, come in, can come in and work at Hagerman. Um, they do receive a, um, a stipend and money for housing on site. Um, and so we have a variety of projects um, in the field. And now that we have a new lab that's gonna be open in a few weeks, um, a myriad of opportunities in the lab. And then we also have interpretive opportunities because we think it's really important for this next generation of scientists to be really good at talking with the public. Um, and so we really like to bring in scientists and get them uh, working with our interpretive team um, to come up with lesson plans and talks and um, programs and things like that. Um, we actually have uh, three interns, guest scientists that will be here um, this winter uh, for our new lab once it opens up. So, um, so that's a great opportunity. And so I recommend if anyone's interested to just look up the scientists in the park program. Um, I know that they just recently, I think they're going to be posting positions soon um, for summer. Um, and so just keep an eye out for that. Thank you. Uh, let's go over to David and see if we have any questions out there. Sure, we have some questions coming in from our audience. Uh, as a reminder, before I get to those questions, if you have questions, now's the time. Go ahead, leave them in the Facebook comments. Or again, if you can't do Facebook, head over to Twitter or Instagram, Gray Fossil Site, and send us some questions there. And we'll start working through these. Grant asks, have any of the Hagerman horses been sampled for proteomics? No, they have not. Um, you know, there actually hasn't been a lot of work done um, on the horses yet. I think part of the reason, um, and something that I didn't allude to at all in the talk, is that um, a lot of our fossils have higher than normal background levels of radiation, uh, particularly in the horse quarry. Um, and so the Smithsonian, when they did their excavations back in the 20s and 30s, uh, they brought about three tons worth of material back uh, to the Smithsonian, and they actually keep the horses in a separate area, uh, separate from their other collections because of the high radon levels. Um, so I think that's deterred some people um, from really doing as much work on the horses as I think um, could and should be done. All right, our next question is from Tim. Uh, is there any primate material found here or, around, or in nearby areas? No, um, so our fossils are between uh, three and four million years old in the Pliocene. And so if we were elsewhere in the world, uh, we would expect to probably find some primate material. Um, but here in North America, um, primates went extinct around the um, Eocene. So we're looking at tens of millions of years uh, before the Hagerman deposits. Um, so if we did find primates, uh, that would be awesome, a little confusing. Um, and I'd be probably afraid to publish on it because <laughs> wonder what we were doing with primates here. Um, but yeah, no, unfortunately we don't have any primate uh, material. Um, but contemporaneous sites elsewhere in the world, especially in Africa, that's a really exciting time for, um, for human evolution. Um, so there's a number of um, early hominids, um, fossil baboons and other primates um, where there's some really rich sites, particularly in um, East and South Africa um, that you can find some really great primate material for this time period. Harry, I have another one related to, to people that might wanna get involved. Are there volunteer opportunities as well? Uh, we do sometimes have volunteer opportunities. Uh, we plan with this new lab um, being opened. Um, you know, we were really um, had a hard time with the lab for the past few years because it's been closed. Um, so being able to have access to it, um, but with it now being open, uh, we do plan on having volunteer opportunities. 
So um, if you're a student and you qualify and we can um, fund you then through a stipend for research and stuff, we can do that. If you wanna come and volunteer either in the new prep lab or in collections or volunteer in the field, um, we'll also um, start having opportunities uh, for that as well. Uh, the MPS does have a VIP program um, and quite often uh, there will be money to provide um, a housing stipend if you're from out of the area. Um, and wanted to come and we usually we ask for um, you know a, a, a minimum amount of time that you're going to be here for at least a few weeks so that we are able to um, have time to train you and you can get a really good experience here. And Carrie, a lot of our students that are here in the east they're not familiar with prospecting and, and you know looking for places where fossils are weathering out and I'm guessing that that's a lot of what you all do is monitor those gullies and surfaces and not necessarily do large scale excavations. Is that correct? Yeah, that's true uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, uh, the Hagerman beds are really steep. Um, so when things erode out, they erode out quickly. Uh, so it's kind of a full-time job just monitoring and looking for things that are eroding out. Um, and the risk is that if you're focusing on excavating somewhere, uh, you could be missing potentially viable, scientifically important specimens that are slowly eroding away elsewhere. Um, and then the other reason for that is that we just don't really have a large staff here. Um, I'm currently a crew of one. We're hiring a preparator in a few months. So if there's any preparators out there, keep an eye out. Uh, we will be hiring one soon. Um, and so it's hard to do larger scale excavations when you don't really have um, a large team. Having said that, uh, we have been doing some um, excavations. Uh, we've started them at, we were doing some at the dog site. Um, which turned out to be fruitful in that we found some more of the dog and confirmed where it came from. Um, and there are a few other areas that have proven to be fossil rich enough that we think that if we did excavate, uh, we could probably start finding some really nice specimens in situ. Um, we largely just need uh, a few more hands on deck to, um, to really start doing some of those larger excavations. Excellent, thank you. David? We've got a question from Jenny who asks, any idea why there are so few large cat fossils? That's a great question. Uh, so cats um, tend to be solitary. Um, and so when you have solitary animals, a lot of times um, they're gonna be less common um, in deposits. Uh, so if you have horses, you might have a herd of 20 or 40 horses. Uh, so there's a greater chance that a number of those are going to die in situations where at least some of their fossils will be preserved. Um, and so one of the reasons that we probably don't have a lot of the cat material is just that they were solitary and there just weren't a lot of cats. Um, it could also be taphonomic in the sense of these cats may have simply been dying in places where their bones just weren't as readily preserved as say like our otters or our beavers or some of our more common animals um, that are found in more marshier um, environments where when they die, they sink into the mud and are more likely to become quickly buried. Carrie, I have a question. Uh, so mm -hmm. your, your otters are, are really interesting that you have two on the landscape. Are they potentially on the landscape at the same time? They are, uh, which is very cool. Um, so our uh, launcher weir eye is only known um, from one locality, um, technically two, but we've um, realized that there's actually a fault there. And so it is one continuous land surface where the two specimens are from. Um, and But at that site, we've also found Cetherium as well. Uh, so we know that both of those otters were actually contemporaneous. Uh, they were a really big difference in size. Uh, so the, if you've ever seen the giant Brazilian otter, um, it's the largest um, otter uh, today in terms of length. Um, our otter was um, very close um, to that size. Um, but then Launcher Weir Eye was the complete opposite end of the spectrum. If you've ever seen small clawed Asian otters, you often see those at zoos. Uh, they're key, tiny little otters or the much rarer marine otter of South America. Those are the smallest otters that we have today. And Launcher Weir Eye was in that size range. Um, so they definitely were of different sizes. Um, so they were, um, you know, utilizing the landscape and the environment, you know, very differently, probably had very different diets and things like that, that allowed them um, to be um, on the landscape at the same time and not competing. So, so you're starting to see kind of this, this ecological scale of how animals interact with each other. And, and, and Hagerman sounds like it's kind of, it's what we call, we talk about the paleontological time machine all the time, but Hagerman, usually they are, you know, you have an old site over here or a young site over there. You usually don't have them right on top of each other in the same place. Do you see kind of shifts in this ecosystem through time where you might see, you know, in some of the earlier deposits, 
one animal kind of taking over some ecological niche that's being replaced by another animal higher up in the deposit? That is an excellent question. And that's exactly uh, the direction that we're trying to go is to really start answering that. Uh, we do have, um, we, the, the beds at Hagerman are basically kind of separated into three units. Um, and we do have kind of like a, a warmer, um, wetter period and a warmer, drier period, and then a more arid, um, what we think was kind of a prolonged drought period. Um, there's been some attempts in the past to kind of look and see how animals may have changed through that time. Um, but unfortunately, that was using localities based on their elevation. Um, so we now know that we can't do that, um, that just because they're in similar elevations doesn't mean they're in similar times. Um, so now that we have these volcanic ashes mapped out, we're going to be able to really start looking at particular slices of time, looking and seeing, OK, which fossils actually come from here, and then moving up to that next slice of time and saying, OK, what's changed? Uh, we do know, uh, for example, our peccaries are much more common um, on the upper um, deposits. Um, so they're coming in later in the sequence when we think things are starting to get a lot more arid and cooler. Um, and our camels tend to be lower in the sequence. Um, but that's just a very generalized um, kind of thing. And we're hoping um, our next step is to really kind of start fine tuning that and answering those kinds of questions. Yeah, I had a similar question to Chris and thinking about animals like the microfauna, the voles, for example, and if there are, if there are target areas that you could potentially approach to looking for that faunal change because they have such a rapid turnover and potential evolutionary rates that could show up within that sequence. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's really unfortunate, you know, I showed those ant hills earlier. Um, ants are great for collecting the microfauna for you, especially on a particularly hot day. You can just sit there with tweezers and just pick all the little rodent teeth off the ant hill, nice and easy. Um, but the provenience is totally shot. Um, ants can actually, I don't know why they do this, but ants can actually transport um, fossils or little pebbles up to 50 feet away from wherever they found it. Um, so you end up not knowing where they came from. And so, yeah, one of the things that we want to do is we do have some sites um, where things were being um, found through screening. Um, so we have a better idea of where exactly they were coming from. And so those are the kind of localities that we want to really start looking at. Uh, so things like rodents, great environmental indicators. Um, birds as well are great environmental indicators. And some preliminary work shows that uh, they're definitely shifting on the landscape, which seems to maybe um, relate to how the, the um, lake may have been um, transgressing and regressing through time. Um, so that's something we want to kind of look into more. Uh, we have someone from the USGS that's looking at diatoms right now, uh, which are another great environmental indicator um, to really start figuring out what the environments were like in different areas. And we've had them work in the past on ostracods, and we'd actually like to expand that study quite a bit as well, um, because that's another thing um, that really helps for uh, reconstructing the environment. So those are kind of all the, um, the next steps that we're um, heading towards. Very interesting stuff. Uh, speaking of rodent teeth, one of our students, Alexis, asked the question, uh, the rodent teeth that you showed had an interesting black color scheme. Is this common for fossil teeth or bone uh, on the site? What's the state of preservation of the teeth? A good question. So the state of preservation really varies um, across the landscape. Um, we do have some areas, unfortunately, there's a fly that has taken a liking to my hairspray. Um, you know, <laughs> we have um, some areas where the preservation is just absolutely beautiful. Um, and then we have others where um, it's very poor preservation. Um, but um, teeth and bones tend to um, pick up a lot of times colors that are in um, the um, soil or the water that they're in. And so um, sometimes we'll actually get bones on the monument that are a beautiful uh, blue color even, um, which is always a nice change of pace from your, you know, your typical kind of beige white fossil uh, to find something that's like a tinge of a blue. So yeah, so wow. they, um, the, the, the amount of preservation varies. Um, unfortunately, things tend to be um, very fragmentary. Um, it's very uncommon to find complete bones, uncommon to find articulated specimens. Um, usually it's isolated things and they're usually um, not complete. Okay, Doug has asked, what is the rate of fossil discovery on the monument? 
Um, it relates greatly to how often I can get out there. Um, <laughs> but uh, every time we go out, we find something. Um, I mentioned our beavers and I wasn't kidding that, um, you know, if, if you go out for a day and you don't come back with some beaver material, uh, I don't know what you're doing out there because it's literally everywhere. Um, but in terms of finding major discoveries, um, we do find major discoveries every couple of years. Uh, so um, this year was the year for Farinestrix, most definitely. Um, and for also um, in this past year for confirming um, the age of our dog. Um, and so we have had actually a number of new species um, or at least new to the park that have been um, identified even in the past few decades. Uh, so, you know, we go out, we don't necessarily find hundreds of fossils on a particular field collection day, um, you know, but we really go for, um, for quality specimens. Um, so turtle shell fragments are something that we just flat out ignore <laughs> these days, we have enough of those. Um, but so it really does depend on uh, what area of the monument we're going to. Some are more fossil rich than others and just the, the luck of the day. It's always fun to hear about which are the overabundant fossils at different fossil sites. Uh, it sounds like your beavers are the equivalent of at Gray, we have tapers and tapers are the ones that we roll our eyes another taper. <laughs> yep, exactly. It's like, ah, oh, it's beaver again. You know, and it's usually it's always good yeah, you know, you know, it's probably going to be beaver when you pick it up, and it usually is. Oh. <laughs> yep, that's how tapers here and turtles, as I think Blaine was just saying. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're just about at the end of our of our time here, I think. So, uh, if Carrie or Blaine or Chris have anything uh, left to say, I think now's about the time. How many horses, Carrie? <laughs> A lot. <laughs> Um, so the Smithsonian, so the general consensus is that the Smithsonian um, pulled out about 200 horses, including 20 nearly complete skeletons. Um, and then we, the horses at the monument are not limited to the horse quarry. We do find horse quarry or horse material all over the monument. Um, so definitely a, a couple herds worth. Carrie, do you have anything else you'd like to add? We're definitely getting to the end of our time. Um, no, I guess that's about it. Um, just, you know, my, my shout out to the USGS and the Pepper Chronology Project, um, Elmira Wynn, um, for um, her supervising and um, for helping with um, bringing Laura Walkup out here. Uh, Laura is a rock star. I call her the Truffle Pig of Tephra. Um, I know she loves that. Um, and just because she literally can find ashes that um, we didn't even know were in existence. Um, so I'm really grateful for the work that she's doing here. Um, and then to Bill Hart and Matt Rusecki, um, who kind of started this project here back in the 90s. Um, you know, they've been really helpful um, sharing their data. Um, and uh, we have some, you know, we're, we're collaborating with them um, on this um, project. So, and then just a final shout out to you guys um, for having um, this Paleo Talk series. I think it's a really cool idea and a really great opportunity to kind of get the science out there for everyone to, to learn about. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. And thanks again for being on the show. We look forward to coming out and visiting you and, and hearing your results at some of the upcoming meetings. Yeah, come out, check out our, our, our new lab. We're excited um, to show it off. Um, and we're also getting a new visitor center and we have a new film that's coming out in a couple months. Wonderful. Um, for the so we've got some really cool things going on at Hagerman right now. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.